it, it consumes you. It's all you want to do. It's all you're doing, you know. And so for me to have an opportunity for that thing to consume me, to be justified, to keep consuming me, that's what it did. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to The Trap Set. I want to play something for you. You're hearing Pink Noise by my guest, Ray Barbie. Primarily known as a skateboarder, Barbie pioneered street skating in the 1980s and has influenced generations of skaters. His passion for skating and music have long been intertwined, and he began releasing his own genre-bending recordings in 2003. A multi-instrumentalist, Ray's collaborators have included John Herndon, Doug Sharon, and Carlos de la Garza. Aside from his work in music and skateboarding, Barbie is also a celebrated photographer. I spoke to him in downtown Los Angeles. And now my conversation with Ray Barbie. Yeah, when people ask me like, what do you do? I tell them that, you know, I skateboard for a living. I turned pro when I was 17, mm -hmm. um, and thankfully, I've that's what I still do to this day. I'll be 48 in, uh, on the 5th of October. But I tell them also that a big part of what I do is I love photography and I play music. And so my sponsors, um, they can utilize my interests in, um, towards what they're doing. So you were just telling me that you were driving around L.A. and shooting photos for Vans, which is one of your sponsors. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so they'll, 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 they'll ask me to, you know, they'll commission me to do photos for either their stores or, um, or if they're doing an article or something. One year they sent me out to Coachella just to, to shoot it from my perspective, which was super fun. I quickly realized that it was kind of boring being in the pit with everybody, so <laughs> yeah. I just started tripping out on the the camping area and and uh, and and all the craziness that was happening outside of the, of the stages, basically, you know. Um, and then and then um, yeah, I'll get opportunities to do music for things too, you know. And so um, a lot of times, fans will ask me to do music for their you know, um, some commercial spot kind of things or, or, um, or just videos that they're working on and things, you know. So you were born in 71? Exactly. Good math, man. And what was on in the house musically when you were growing up? So, you know, I was born in San Francisco. We lived in Daly City. My parents um, met in, in the service. Uh, my dad was in the Marines, and um, I know a lot of my... Was he uh, in Nam? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was. Um, I know a lot of my kind of uh, getting excited about a lot of things and, and wanting to, um, you know, explore all these interests and things. I know I get a lot of that from him, because... You know, he really um, he really utilized his opportunities on the base. You know, he played. Um, he was a wide receiver on like the the football team that they had there. He he uh, played saxophone. Um, he boxed, um, and so, anyways, my parents they met in the service. My dad's from Arkansas. And then my mom's from Mobile, Alabama. And basically when they were done with their service, 
um, they moved to San Francisco. Your mom was in the Marines also? No, so my mom, I can't, I think she was, um, she was more in the medical department and I, I can't remember if it was Marines or, or where she served, you know. Mm-hmm. But at any rate, they met when they were both, both serving, basically. Grew up with my dad having a jazz band. I'll never forget being probably like four or five and just we had like a little cellar basement kind of set up there and that's where he would practice with his band and so you know I have I have I remember being at the door watching them what did he play alto tenor he was alto Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he had a dark room there oh wow yeah yeah so he printed and shot photos and and so um, has he ever done a show no, he never did, and he kind of got out of it. Like we have a lot of prints that he made, just family. He just he was kind of more of like he wasn't really a I don't know how you want to say it. He wasn't really a fine art guy. He just loved that, that was just the technology at that point. Mm-hmm. But he had the interest in printing it himself. But what he shot was just family stuff. You know what I mean? And so um, it was just way more just about. You know, it was kind of like that time's version of, you know, you shoot your trip and you go take it to the drugstore and you get your prints back and then you have it for the, but it was, it was him doing that, but then him printing it and putting that in the photo albums. And so, yeah, I grew up with a steady diet of jazz and soul, you know, as you can imagine, it was just a lot of Motown. Um, You know, he loved Harold Marvin and the Blue Notes. Um, he loved Ramsey Lewis trio. He was kind of a little more, I don't know how you want to say it, straight ahead with his jazz. Because I remember him telling me he didn't really, he wasn't feeling Coltrane. It was a little too, you know, out kind of thing, you know. He was kind of more, you know, I want to say like Dexter Gordon and a little more before they started really exploring Mm -hmm. that instrument or pushing it out you know yeah i mean i guess you could also say dexter was exploring and pushing it out based on you know what what? i always yeah for sure but where it was at that point yeah and to be honest with you it was uh cannonball adelaide oh my god was a little more of like i think closer to his speed if you will well i mean he was one of the all-time greats too yeah yeah, but what I'm saying is my dad, I just remember tripping out because I just thought, you know, it's like, you know, Coltrane was like Hendrix to me for for the sax, right? So you can always you can always assume like, or it's no different than somebody saying, oh, you play guitar? You must love Hendrix. Right. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? And yeah. so it was really interesting for me when I got into music years and years later being like, dad, and I'm finding out about Coltrane, I'm like, dad thinking he was going to be like, yeah, son. He was like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's lots of different eras of Coltrane, too. I mean, if we're talking about Cannonball, you know, there's the era where um, Coltrane was playing in Miles' group with Cannonball in the 50s on that, like, um, the Milestones record, for example. Yeah. And that was more straight ahead. But then by the 60s, 70s, 60s when interstellar space came out that was like a of completely course. different place <laughs> of course yeah you know was your mom into music too yeah my mom was yeah i mean she you know again they loved you know they loved what was happening and what was happening especially in our culture and community was a lot of soul yeah you know and so yeah we had all those albums you know um when i say those albums yeah like motown's catalog and Stacks and mm-hmm. you know, um, and so you know they kind of had a shared. Basically, we ha- we had in our living room we had a, um, you know, it was one of those setups where it was your 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 stereo system where you had you know on the top you had your turntables and Mm -hmm. then you had the receiver and then you had the tape deck Mm -hmm. and then at the bottom was a glass where all the vinyls yeah a console stereo yes exactly and so that was it and so what was in what was in that 
the cabinet at the bottom that was their collection and that's i don't your know DNA. Who's, that's uh, that's you pretty much <laughs> well it's interesting yeah it, it was me until i got into skateboarding and then it was denying that because uh, yes. now it's all about punk rock mm-hmm. and and what they called new wave but it was a lot of the stuff that i came to because of skateboarding which was b-52s blondie um devo police basically what was being played in the 70s era skate parks and then when the skate parks closed down in the late 70s it turned into backyard ramps then at that time it had pushed into hardcore Mm -hmm. so then it's minor thread and local kind of hardcore metal rock kind of Mm-hmm. punk ba- bands that were shows that were happening you know but i was in san jose and so you know yeah like we we knew about you know who you know uh, who didn't know about dead kennedys right but there's a lot of circle jerks there's a lot of like black flag a lot of minor threat a lot of bad brains happening and at the time it didn't feel like you could like soul and hardcore it felt like you had to delineate and choose well no what's heavy is like you know for me like i got you know i always say it i'm an mtv baby like mtv came out when i was in fifth grade yeah that was heavy because now i put a visual to what you might come across in the radio i say might because in my parents car there wasn't too much of the rock stations or anything right and so you hear about these bands from friends in like you know elementary school or their brothers or something right Mm -hmm. and so what i'm trying to say is i didn't grow up around that at home right right i grew up with soul and jazz right and so with um but the 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 but me hearing like you know rock or metal or anything that was from cruising with friends and maybe their parents were listening to it or they somehow had it. I heard it through them basically, right? Mm -hmm. But now MTV brings it into my home. Yeah, and And, and when MTV first launched, it was pretty much all rock. It was 24 seven music, which is is kind of a heavy kind of uh, aspiration, if you will. But what was really cool about it was it was before the music videos, so content-wise, it was concert footage, right? And so I would see all these concerts, and you're right, a lot of it was on the metal rock end. Like, mm-hmm. you know, they would play Let There Be Rock by ACDC, like the movie, the motion picture, or they'd play Song Remains the Same. But then they had all these, again, like concert footage. So I'd see like, blizzard of oz concert tour or something or see like the iron maiden tour or you know these shows um and so for me i quickly got enamored with the guitar hero because i remember i'd see i'd see like the vocalist come up and you're like okay he's the main dude right and i'm like okay he's pretty cool but then when it that point in the song where the guitarist steps up and he takes a solo via Angus Young or Eddie Van Halen or whoever. Then I'm like, that dude's really cool. And so that gave me an interest towards guitar, mm-hmm. playing guitar. Mm-hmm. Right around that time when MTV came out, my dad would take me, my brother and my sister. There was a local um, record store in town called Rainbow Records. And he started taking us there and he would let us pick one tape. And, and, and I think it was like the end of the week, so he'd take us like on a Friday or something. That's a great tradition. Yeah, so we went and like, because of MTV, I'll never forget, I was into ACDC. My brother was into Huey Lewis and the News. <laughs> and my sister was into Joan Jett and the Blackhearts. <laughs> And so, yeah, I'd go there, I'd get, I, f- I forget which one I started with, maybe back in, 
back in black or something right and because we each had our own little uh cassette player it's just like this little little guys with one speaker Mm -hmm. on one end Mm -hmm. with the handle built into it the handle on the front then the the transport Mm -hmm. and then the tape and then the speaker above it it's kind of like this vertical thing and so get that tape and i just be in my room listening to it going into my world thinking i'm angus young right and the solo comes up and i'm sitting there like pretending i'm in the band you know and so um you could feel it in your body when you listen to it that way right like did you feel lifted i just i just didn't need for me we had like maybe two tvs i can't remember there's one in the living room one in my parents room or something you know and so you know the tape made it to where i could have privacy and be in my world Mm -hmm. i couldn't go into that world in the living room with everybody and not everybody would be down to just be listening to a whole album of (laughs) acdc and so for me oh man yeah that's a good point it's like almost a feeling of vulnerability when you give yourself over to the music and enjoy it that much where like if you're listening to it around other people you don't feel like you can yeah you don't that place as what as well yeah like it was i was like i was in my own space privacy right like you can go into your own world and that's what that experience with the tape deck and having the tape because also like the concerts i think were like friday night concerts or something but throughout the week for their content again because they didn't have that many videos yet they would make they would chop up songs from concerts and show rotate them that way so you might get like for those about to rock and then it's um you know maybe it's um diver down or something live or and then it's you know what i mean 666 or something iron maiden like what i'm saying is they would chop them up into songs Mm -hmm. so the cool thing about the tape was like i could just stay in acdc world anytime i want and just play the whole album Mm -hmm. you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and in my room like me and my bro shared a room but it was like if he was out or whatever then i'd have the door shut and put on the tape and just be like if i had like a some music magazine or something you just be in your world right when did you get a skateboard in between sixth and seventh grade the summer my buddy that lived up the street from me we just always ran around town riding bikes getting into whatever he gets a skateboard for his birthday and the skateboard that i had experienced before my buddy gets a skateboard for his birthday is what people would probably know now is like a penny board, but we call them banana boards, and they were just plastic, yeah, small skateboards. You kind of didn't pay too much attention and give it too much thought because the second I get on it, I just remember it flex. It's super slow. The wheels were like mushy, and you're just kind of like, ah, oh, whatever, <laughs> right? But the skateboard that my buddy got for his birthday now you're like whoa like you can do something with this you could tell that it was a part of this bigger thing it was like you know the window into this world because the board was just like glorious it was you know 10 foot 10 inches wide 30 inches long had a graphic on the bottom that was very graphic. Can you remember what colors. it was? Yeah, it was a Veriflex Vectra. That's mm-hmm. the name of the, the board. And so it was, and it was this company, Veriflex, where you could tell that that skateboard, like it, you could tell that whoever the art designer was, he was on this like new wave thing, right? Cause it's all this, the colors of it and these graphic lines shooting, you know, every which way on the board and and so um we're talking like 83 right exactly yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and so um so now my buddy danny's got that board and now when we're running around the neighborhood getting into whatever he's got that and i'm on my bike and i'm like dude he's having way more fun than (laughs) i am and i was like i gotta get one 
And I remember telling him, I was like, I want to get a skateboard. And he's like, he was telling me, he's like, you know, my dad used to, my dad used to skate. So I think he has his old board in the garage. And his dad is the one who got him the skateboard for, for uh, his birthday. And so sure enough, we go out in the garage and we find it. And his dad gives it to me, which is amazing. And um, his dad was like a 70s skater, you know. And so the board was like a 70s board. It's called the Sims Wood Kick. And it's called a wood kick before, it was before they made the molding to, you know, to lift up the tail and the nose. And so back then to get, to give you that feel, they would just put a wedge, like a, a slanted wedge on the tail. Of wood. Of wood, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Right. And so it's not molded up. It's not bending up. You're just adding to it to give it that, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> And so it wasn't the newer boards, but it wasn't the banana boards. You know, it wasn't those plastic boards. It split the difference. It was in the middle. And so I was in. Did it make sense to you right away? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, you know, it's funny. Like, I just know that my personality, and I've seen it over the years, it's just if I'm excited about something, I just go towards it. And um, the interest becomes so intense that I just got to go for it. And the sense aspect of it, I don't, I don't know. I just know I got to do it. <laughs> and then what I see is if it's something that um, I'm excited about and passionate about, then it, I tend to figure it out to a point of where I can continue to enjoy it. And, and so, um, so I guess along the process, I guess it makes sense, but I guess what I'm trying to say is I never think about it that way. I think about it way more in like, I just got to do it. Well, when did you stop thinking about yourself as a kid who skateboarded as a hobby and start thinking of yourself as an actual skateboarder? That's a great question. Um, you know, right away, when we got, when we went back to um, middle school again, this, I, my buddy gets his skateboard at the summer before seventh grade. So now we're going to middle school. We're like, dude, we ride a skateboard. I don't think we were thinking too specific about I don't know if we were super conscious about we're skateboarders now. Yeah. We're just excited. And we've been we've been trying to have fun on this new thing, right? Show up to school and we're like, do those guys look like skaters? <laughs> and we kind of walk in their zone and one of them comes over to us and they're like you know, what you guys do over the summer? What do you do? And we're like, oh, we skateboard. And they're like, you skate? We skate too. Come hang out with us. And that brotherhood of dudes that were open arms to us, all inclusive to us, those guys now, they're the ones with the ramps because they've been doing it longer, right? And so they're plugged into the community. They have a punk band. And so before when it was like, man, like, it'd be so cool to have a guitar. But it, was, it wasn't in my world. I didn't know anybody who had an electric guitar or anything. So that just seemed like no different than like, be cool to be an actor or something, <laughs> be in the movies. It was like that far. But these dudes in skateboarding brought it so much closer. Right, because up until then, your relationship with the guitar was in your own like private fantasy world when you're sitting there listening to Eddie Van Halen rip solos. It was a broom. Yeah.
And so now, now these guys, you know, now when we're skating the ramp and when we're done, they're having band practice and I'm hanging out with them at the band practice. Now I'm bugging them to play the guitar after and then they're teaching me and then before long I'm in the band, you know. And, um, and, and it's all about accessibility, you know. And I'm so thankful that um, that's what skateboarding's done for me and in, in, in all my interests, just made it accessible. When did you start thinking about becoming professional? I never thought about becoming professional. It just kind of st- stumble bummed into it kind of thing, you know. Um, I was just excited and we were just skating and learning tricks and and coming up with things that we had never seen but always figured somebody else was doing, you know. I come in kind of the tail end of the backyard ramp era. And so my buddies, they we built a ramp together. We started with a little quarter pipe in the garage of my buddy Todd's house, and that's where the band practiced too. So we'd be in the garage taking turns going down the driveway, hitting the quarter pipe, and then coming back, get back in line, next guy go, right? Then a friend is wanting to get rid of his quarter pipe, so then we say, hey, let's get his quarter pipe, add it to our quarter pipe, and make a half pipe up at Mike's house. So it was like five foot high, eight foot wide. Um, And then we go from that to eight foot high, 20 foot wide, ramp and so we kind of got bigger with the ramp and so during that time I slammed doing a trick it's called a body jar and basically I came down I'm, I'm in the air probably about four feet out and I'm trying to hit my tail on the coping to come back into the transition but my wheel hits and just throws me out um, and this was on another ramp, which is 11 feet high. So I'm probably, you know, 11, you add about whatever, three feet or something to that. So 14 feet to the flat bottom, the bottom onto my wrist. <clears throat> and so I break my wrist. And during that time that I had my cast, my parents are like, you're not skateboarding with that cast. <laughs> So I'm like, okay, but my buddy Robert has a backup board at his house, and I'd always go to his house after school. I'd take the bus from school to, to his house. We're in high school at this point. Um, I'm a, uh, I think I'm a freshman at this point. I couldn't go out to the ramps because I knew I would get busted because it was too far, right? And so we didn't skate the ramps. We just started skating street. And up until that point, we would skate street when either the neighbors would tell us to, you know, it's too loud, you guys got to stop skating now when we're skating our buddy Mike's ramp at his house. Or we, or it was just getting dark, you know, and, but we'd still want to skate. So we'd go to like the local gas station and pretend that the curb was the top of the ramp, you know, and kind of still be skating. But that was as far as what street was at that point. But now I've got a cast on. I can't skate the ramp. I'm approaching street different because it's all I have. (laughs) And so that coupled with now people are starting to make jump ramps now. During that time that I had my cast exploring street, I quickly realized that, man, There's more freedom here because the ramps, it has a list of tricks. It's been around longer and it it already has so much development in it to where you're constantly playing catch up. There's a list like, okay, I learned an invert. Okay, I learned rock and rolls. I learned 50-50s. Okay. What next? Okay, I learned frontside ollies. Okay, what next? But that list goes forever, right? With street skating, it was like, okay, we learned the ollie, learned the kickflip. I'm like, where's the rest of the stuff? And so it was really exciting, this idea of like, whoa, you mean we can just try stuff? 
and it's specific to or it's influenced by your environment you know schoolyards or or gas stations or you know loading docks or whatever right now it's just opened up and so during that time I was like yeah I'm kind of like skating ramps cool but I want to I'm having more fun here the the industry at that time was pushing this idea of like street style they called it street style and so they saw that you know what we think the way skateboarding's moving it's going to the streets if you will it's not going to be these ramps because it's not as accessible mm-hmm. to skate the ramp you have to know the dude that knows the dude that has the ramp in his backyard and then to have a ramp in your backyard then it becomes socioeconomic kind of things right of like well your parents have to own the home and you have to have the resources to build this ramp and blah 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 right mm-hmm. and so i think the industry started seeing that like you know what there could be more participants more people buying skateboards in the streets right and so this street style idea was starting to bubble up and emerge within the landscape of the business of skateboarding in the industry. And so Robert calls Steve Rocco and is like, hey, like we're entering these contests, we're placing top five every time, you know, and he, I don't know how he pitched it, but we got a package from Steve. It was like two skateboards and two sets of wheels. And we were just like, <laughs> we're like we're sponsored you know and i think that was the time that was the moment when i was like maybe there's something here but i didn't really think too much about it i was just like whoa my parents move us to southern california in like eight like the summer before so it's had to be in like 87 the summer before my junior year because i graduated in 89 so it had to be like 87 ish or mm-hmm. something We move out, which was funny because, you know, in skateboarding, much like hip hop, how, you know, hip hop's got the East, had the East Coast, West Coast kind of rivalry thing, right? Skateboarding has, in California, it had, at that time, it had the NorCal, SoCal kind of rivalry. Thrasher being NorCal and Trans World Skateboarding being SoCal. And so I come from the NorCal thing. And so I remember telling my friends, like, yeah, I got to move to Southern California. They're like, man, trader. And, you know, (laughs) it had that kind of tone to it, right? And so, and I was bummed. I was was in that, too. I was just like, oh, man, this is going to suck, right? But I go there. Now I'm in the... I'm in the Mecca, right? I'm in the heart of the industry, like, all the brands are in Southern California. Now I'm in the backyard of all my heroes, like like Mark Gonzalez, um, Nadis Coppice, um, Lance Mountain, like all these guys live in Southern California. I mean, you know, because Southern, you know, the deal, Southern California spreads out so much. So from LA to San Diego and everything in between, kind of. And so... Um, so now I'm, I'm skating demos and contests. There's a, a, a contest circuit called Castle, California Amateur Skateboard League. And that's when all the amateurs would come together for these contests and you kind of see who's, who's skating, who are these guys. And again, at the time, the industry is still vert. It's still about backyard ramps. You know, 90% of what is in Thrasher and Transworld at that time is all vert pros or amateurs, right? Street is, again, this thing bubbling underneath that not really getting too much attention in that realm, but it's building up underneath doing its thing. And so um, that was really important to us, too, because that was our way to connect with that community was to go to these contests. The reality is, is I just wanted to be sponsored so that they could help fund these trips mm-hmm. to go to these contests and to, and to be a part of this thing. 
because that's where our heart was. We were super excited about that, you know. At the time, were you thinking maybe when I'm in my 40s, I'll be making a living skateboarding? No way. <laughs> what else did you want to do with your life at that time? Like, only skateboard. Okay. Only skateboard. And there was but did no. Did you have a guitar too? No, I never. So here's the thing: like guitars were too expensive, so I never ever owned my own guitar until I became amateur and sponsored by Pal Peralta. And again, all of this stuff is so new. There wasn't a model of what it could look like in this. Yeah, you had your Mark Gonzalez's, you had your Tommy Guerrero's, and your Nadas Coppices, but. We didn't know if we could be taken serious. This like bubbling, young, street skating, circuit, whatever you want to call it. You know what I mean? And so up at that point, all of our sponsors were like, they just kind of flowed us stuff, but there wasn't really a program for us. They just kind of knew that this was something going on, and they probably thought, like, well, it's just good to have them out in the streets to mm -hmm. bring recognition to our brand. There wasn't anything saying that you can make a viable living being a pro skateboarder. I mean, pro street skateboarder. So it's interesting, because even though we were sponsored and stuff, we just were just taking whatever we can get. We didn't know how much potential was really there to make a living at all. And you're so in the moment, day by day. I just wasn't even thinking. I'm in high school, you know? And so, yeah, there was no thought in, like, some kind of career at all. We just was, we were just in, I was just in the moment, just, you know, because I talk to friends or I'll, I'll hear friends in their interviews, and they had it planned out, and they were like, yeah. I'm pushing for this. I didn't have that. I was just like, I'm, I'm this is fun. I'm doing it, and... And it's just, I'm getting these opportunities, and this is a blast, you know. Were your parents supportive? Yeah, they were supportive. I mean, early on, there was, you know, there were some rocky moments where my dad had to kind of, you know, calm my mom's nerves, you know, because I'd come home, again, broken limbs or gouged out face and gouged out chin kind of thing. And super early on, breaking windows, trying to learn how to ollie, you know, and so, and that wasn't cheap, you know, and so I think, you know, I know early on it was probably tough for my parents, they're just kind of like, you know, and, and just the risk aspect, you're skating on the street, no helmet or anything. Skaters were viewed as kind of outlaws at that point. Yeah. Like cops would come hassle you, I would assume. Yeah, I mean, I think in the 80s, like, it hadn't really gotten to that point per se so much. I think a lot of it kicked in with the when street really started to happen because now your terrain are people's properties, mm -hmm. businesses, schoolyards. Becomes way more issues of like these people, these skaters are just a nuisance because they're wrecking our property. You know what I mean? They're trespassing, mm -hmm. and then the liability aspect like man what if these kids break their neck and their parents come after us and sue and so there's a lot of that kind of stuff that kind of came the more that street skating grew mm -hmm. you know and so um it was right around senior year where i'll never forget i had come out before that, I'd come out in a video for Powell Prouta called Public Domain. And from the, the video part that I had in there, which I shared with, um, we were called the Rubber Boys. And I shared that video, that segment of the video, I shared that with uh, Chet Thomas, Eric Sanderson, and Steve Size, three other um, amateur street skaters for Powell Prouta. That video was so well received that after that video, Stacy was like, we want to turn you pro because of the response that they were getting because of um, my segment. And that was middle of senior year. 
And so that was right around with all the talks of like, okay, like, where are you going to go to college? What are you doing? Right. Was there a talk of joining the Marines? No, no. My pop was awesome. I say was because he passed away in 97, prostate cancer. Okay. But um, no, my dad was rad. He's, yeah, he wasn't pushing none of that. He didn't push. Was he a career uh, Marine? No. No, okay. So I think it was an opportunity. You know, it was an opportunity for him to do something. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? He, He lost his dad, my grandpa, lost him when he was eight years old. So it was just him and my grandmother, you know? My grandma is my hero. She lived with us, actually, that whole time until she passed away right before I graduated. Mm. And so my dad was a mechanic by trade. He worked on cars. And Can so, you fix cars? No. I steer clear of that. And my, and, and, uh, I wish I could fix cars. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's heavy about skateboarding? It consumes everything. Mm-hmm. It's one of those things, you know, as cliche as it says, you know, when people say the certain interests are lifestyle, like that is one for sure. It's like, you know, it's, it, it consumes you. It's all you want to do. It's all you're doing, you know? And so for me to have an opportunity for that thing to consume me, to be justified, to keep consuming me, that's what it did. Mm-hmm. And so, the, you know, there was no time. There's no interest in working on cars or anything. I was already pushing towards playing music. Mm -hmm. I was playing guitar and being in bands. Once you turned pro. Well, no, I played, it took the back seat. It took a back seat for a while. You know, once skateboarding was just, skateboarding is to push that out, you know, like early on playing in the punk bands and playing, but guitar was so expensive that I never owned my own. I was always borrowing like my buddy, Mike Griffin's brother's guitar because his brother wasn't playing anymore. And, and so I, I never owned my own guitar to kind of still keep it and playing at home. And then once skateboarding just kind of had its momentum and just just had me, then that took a back seat, especially once I started getting into street skating. Because the thing with street skating is it's so accessible. You don't have to worry about getting to your buddy's house. You don't have to worry about, you know, the neighbors saying you guys got to stop now. You can do it. 24 7 as long as as long as my parents would let me be outside i could be street skating and that's what i did basically you know but then in high school um you know i had friends that didn't skate that were playing in bands and they and and i would tell them like yeah i used to play guitar i haven't played in a while and they're like hey come hang out and then i'd hang out with them and then start kind of getting into it again i mean it was always around i just didn't have my own Mm -hmm. i had like a mess a beat up i had an opportunity to super cheap buy like a a les paul copy but it was so janky it didn't work really and so i had it i would noodle with it but it wasn't inspiring so it was just kind of uh, um but it wasn't until high school that i started to kind of get back into it but now I'm riding, I'm amateur for Palo Peralta. And so we would do these tours as amateurs, but amateurs during that time didn't get paid. But I remember hearing that one of the other guys who was amateur went on one of these grueling tours and that he didn't get paid, but he asked Palo Peralta to buy him something. And then I was like, ooh, maybe I can ask them to buy me a guitar. And so we got done with this summer tour. And I remember calling Stacy Peralta and just beating around the bush. And I remember Stacy just being like, Ray, come out with it. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, a guitar, Stacy. And he's like, okay, send me the information and then we'll get it. And, and I was super into, I always dug the bangles and, and that kind of LA Rodney on the rocks kind of scene where it was like the bangles, red cross, um, you know, even Voice of the Beehive, um, Runaways. I got turned on to the Runaways through Rodney. Um, and then you start to see kind of that community and you're like, oh, oh, crazy. Like Red Cross, Greg Hetson was in Red Cross, but then he was in Circle Jerks. And then you just start to see the community, right? And so anyways... I love Robert Hecker. He was the guitarist, the lead guitarist for Red Cross during this time. Uh, Neurotica was the album, Red Cross Neurotica. And those guys, those guys all got 
kind of sponsored by Carvin. So I think it was Red Cross and Bangles. Vicky Peterson from the Bangles, I think it was sponsored by Carvin. So I was on this Carvin thing. <laughs> yes. And so that's what I sent Stacy. I was like, I want this Carvin guitar. And so I'll never forget coming home from school, seeing this big box on the porch. And that was it was the Carvin guitar. And so with that guitar, I started playing more. back to you know talks of going to college i'm sponsored by powell peralta the video public domain comes out now powell saying we want to turn you pro i'll never forget george powell and stacy peralta those are the guys who own powell peralta them coming out and having a meeting with my parents like taking my mom and dad out they went out to dinner and i remember where did they go um they went it wasn't Sioux Plantation, but it, it might have been. I can't remember the exact. I'll have to ask my mom the exact restaurant, but it was up the street from our house. And, you know, because I'm 17. And so they're just laying out everything contract, everything. Like, and my parents come home and they're like, so yeah, you're going to go, like, we're, we're behind you going pro. And like we'll we'll help we'll sign the contract with you and everything and and um, yeah and the crazy thing it's, it's kind of no looking back since the first check came I don't want to say how much it was but my first check came from my board royalties when my skateboard came out you know my parents looked at each other and they were like okay Ray's all right <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to say how much it was nah but but it, but it was a lot of money for a 17 year old oh, kid oh man it's a lot of money money for grown ups wow yeah did yeah. you were you smart with it did you invest it or um, save it so um, unfortunately i lost the early on that the early um, what I made early on, a lot of that, I got hit hard with taxes because my parents didn't know the right accountants to work with. You get hit hard. Yeah. You get hit hard. And so if you don't have someone who's savvy to help you know. But if you own Amazon, then you don't get hit hard. <laughs> you <know? laughs> if you're making billions, then you're good. Yeah. Yeah. And so... And so, you know, I'm thankful. I mean, I, I'm, I'm thankful that I've done, I've done all right with my opportunities and I'm able to provide for my family and still chase my dreams, you know. And, and um, Tell me about your family. Oh, yeah. So I have uh, been married for 19 years. Uh, my wife, Stephanie, and we have two sons, uh, Nolan and Maxwell. And so my oldest is Nolan, and he's 17, turned 17 on the 4th of July. And then Maxwell is 12 now, but he'll be 13 in September. Do they skate? Nolan does. Nolan can skate. He's working right now um, in Long Beach. There's a program called Skate Dogs. This guy Adam started, and uh, they go around to elementary schools and work with, provide like a skateboard program, basically. And so he works with him, and it's their summertime now, and so they're doing camps. So he's been getting up every morning, riding out to Manhattan to do these uh, skate camps, you know. Um, but he's he's into music. He went to School of Rock early on for a few years, playing bass, mm -hmm. got really good fast, um, was a part of their, um, what do they call it, their, their house band, which is kind of the band that they kind of 
kind of show off the program with you know so they play like a lot of events and things like that so he was a part of that for a while but all the rippers that he played with they all aged out because he was like the youngest in their thing and so he was just kind of over it after those dudes left he got spoiled the next cats (laughs) coming in weren't really into it as much or or talent level wasn't the same so he just became disinterested and so um so then he left that after three years and then recently He's gotten into boxing. He's so cool. hyped on it, and he's ripping, and he's so ripped right now. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really cool, man. It's really cool to see him be into something that has a lot of parallels with skateboarding and how I experienced getting into what I love, you know? Because the boxing thing has a lot in common with skateboarding, you know? It's so it's different than a team sport, right? And so because of that, there's way more room for camaraderie and there's way more, well, not just camaraderie, but the aspect of camaraderie that's not competitive, that's encouraging and, and, and um, you know, and, and makes you feel that you're, you're part of it no matter what your level is. Because that's what skateboarding has. You don't have to be first string to be, you know, uh, accepted. There's no class kind of thing, per se, like you would, like on a team, right? And therefore, people don't look at your, they don't need something from you, per se. That's the difference, right? Like a team sport, everybody's relying on each other, so they need you for what they're trying to do. So if you're blowing it, they're like, dude, you shouldn't even have been out there. Like, you should be on the bench. You shouldn't even start or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. But in boxing, it's like, who? nobody, they just want to see you do your thing. I encourage you and do your thing because they're doing their thing and you're not hindering them from doing their thing. And so it's really cool seeing how that gym, boxing gym environment has a lot of, you know, common um aspects to skate shops you know because that's how i felt being a part of you know going to skate shops it was just like you just felt that it was a place where you were accepted and where people were encouraging and wanted to see everybody succeed towards their goals you know how did having kids change your perspective as uh as it relates to skating and, and art and your, how did it change the way that you approach the world? What my boys have helped me to come to the conclusion of over the years is that I think the questions got to shift from how can I get this to make money to does this give me joy? That's the dictating factor if you should do it or not. Not if you should make money doing it, but if it brings you joy. If it brings you something that can allow you to enjoy life, right? To have this experience in life that um, is pleasing. Has there ever been a time um, when skating failed to bring you joy? Of course. I mean... You know, I just think that's just the reality, right? That's the part that, you know, like the Warriors just lost, right? It is that dynamic, right? Like you need you need the highlights and the shadows. It can't be all highlights and it can't be all shadows, right? Right. And in a weird way, it all, that's the process and it helps the fuel Right. And so I feel like my perspective that's been developed from skateboarding is because I've had so much experience from falling down and getting back up from defeat to aspects of victories. It's, you know, and so in skateboarding, yeah, in the defeated times, it's rough, but because there's fire and there's passion to do it, it makes you push harder to get to the victory. And then once you get to it, it's the challenge of it. I think that's why I'm still stuck with film or why I love to 
the process of recording on tape, you know, it's because, you know, I'm so used to the sense of accomplishment that comes from taking the away battle. that safety net. But, well, just the battle, just yeah. the like, like the accomplishment aspect of it. Like, well, it makes it makes your resources finite. If you're shooting a roll of film, you have so many exposures. Well, that's a whole. When different. you're tracking to tape. You can't um, just yeah. like comp it together. Yeah, that is part of the the aspect that makes it to where, um, when you get to that place where you're you you feel that you've accomplished something, then you really f feel that sense of satisfaction because you had to work hard to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, you know. Sometimes with shooting a digital photo and it's on the computer, I'm like, what did I do? What did I work for? I like you kind of there's a sense of just like I don't have that sense of like oh, I accomplished that. I can't take dare I say pride because it just happened so easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know it's on skating, like I always would doubt myself. I go film a trick and if I got that trick first, second try, I'm like, How hard like should I even put that in my part? Because it came pretty easy. You know what I'm saying? So I think there's just this idea of like working for something feeling that sense of accomplishment that that plays a huge part of the process of keeping the fire burning towards it because it's like you know like i guarantee you steph curry right now is thinking about upping his you know practice regiment over this off season because he's not going out like that again. You know what I mean? I guess what I'm trying to say is like that stuff drives you. You need that stuff. If you don't have it, then it gets boring or it's just you need that thing that you have to fight towards to get to. And that's what skating, you know, I don't know how much to credit skateboarding for me having that desire, but I do know that skateboarding developed that to another level. Right. If I came to skateboarding with a little bit of that, skateboarding built up that muscle to be functioning at a way different intensity. And when did you feel like you had the confidence to try making records? It's just like anything. Just go for it and share it with friends. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I yeah. don't know. I, one thing I do know is that anything that anything that I get into, there is I do have a sense of there's a proper time and procedure for every matter. Like because of skateboarding, I will get opportunity to do stuff before it's time. You know, like because people just get excited and want to do stuff, and so I'll never forget seeing like Keona Reeves on on like um, David Letterman with his band Dog Star and I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, in a certain right, basketball just because, players. Just because you, you yeah. can make a hip hop record as a basketball player, maybe you shouldn't. Exactly. Unless you've put in enough work. Yeah. Like, yeah. The same amount of work that you put I've into always, becoming a basketball player. I've always felt that like, you know, the biggest compliment for me ever towards these other interests are man, I dig what you do. I didn't even know you were a pro skateboarder, you know? And so I try to make sure that um, whatever I'm excited about what I'm doing, if I want to present it to somebody, I try to make sure that I have a piece that I can feel that I've, I'm, I don't want to say it. I want to feel that I can, live with whatever anybody says about it and that comes from me being like okay i feel strong because of my community or whatever that like okay i'll put this out there now and then if people don't feel it i can live with that but if i just put it out there and no one feels it and i'm like i know i kind of didn't either <laughs> 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 that's kind of that's kind of that's the worst you know and so um and so for me, it is, a, um, yeah, it is a big desire to um, 
if I put something out there, make sure that I have a piece that it's ready. And so with the music thing and recording, like, yeah, I could just woodshed all day long. I had a friend, basically what happened was, I, I was playing in a band with my friends um, in Huntington Beach. I lived in Corona, California, um, which was, you know, it's about 45 minute drive up the 91. And um, yeah, that was a time where I was kind of back into playing. I was really getting into it. And so, and I think that happened around me. I, there was a time where I kept, kept messing up my ankles. And so I'd have a lot of downtime. And so I was playing a lot of music, playing a lot of guitar, and just always listening to music. And the cool thing about that is, much like a skate video, the more I would just hear about new bands and listen to stuff, the more I'd be like, I want to play. You're just inspired to play. And so, you know, and, and traveling and touring a lot, you're listening to a lot of music in the van or on the flights and stuff, you know. And so I just, that really kind of created more of a desire to be more consistent with playing and, and actually progressing, you know. And so, um, so yeah, when I was home, buddies inviting me out, much like in high school, buddies being like, hey, come jam with us. Come bring your guitar. And then... The more I would do that and be in there, that community, and a lot of them were just like, they come from skateboarding, that culture, and surfing, but they were way more into playing music, so they were just about going to shows and playing music, you know? Um, I eventually got in a band with those friends, and we had this band called Coldwater Crane, and Coldwater Crane, um, the guys in the band were super motivated to be doing stuff. So they were always setting up shows. So we we're playing out a lot. But I would get these tours, duty calls, right? And so they just got tired of me not being able, being out on these tours. And so um, when that happened, I was like, dude, I still want to be playing music. And so I had a friend, um, my friend Monet, his family friend. Uh, she used to be married to the Arabian Prince from NWA, and and she was a singer. Like she she she's at that time she had already moved on to doing um, insurance. She became like insurance broker and kind of thing. But early on, she had aspirations to do music, and so they had she had she still had a lot of their equipment. So she had this four track, um, the Tascam. 424. Uh, no, it was oh. a Tascam 280, maybe? It was a rad old 80s one with the VU meters. I think it was awesome. Had a special sound to it. Not like those 424s, the newer, okay. the blue newer guys. It was like the old 80s dudes. Mm -hmm. I mean, they even had like in the mixer. Was it a, a cassette 4 yes, track? cassette. Yeah, yeah okay. for sure. Because 80s. Yeah. Big guy. It's big. Um, with that whole scheme with the orange and the blue and the brown. Um, the, the, it gave me two channels, just mixer channels, so you can kind of send your effects back through it, you know, and kind of uh, EQ your effects or whatever. Um, but what's super cool is that the EQ, it had, uh, it had a um, frequency and gain, which is pretty hit for a four track. And so, anyways, I just started tracking at home, just tracking ideas, you know. Tommy Guerrero was a big inspiration because Tommy was doing a lot of stuff on 4-Track during that time. And, and I'm, I think around that time, somewhere, I'm foggy with my memory uh, in, in the, the sequence of things, but around that time, too, I think it was like listening to Sebado. And Lou Barlow had a lot of four track stuff. Mm -hmm. And then there was um and then there was Guided by Voices. And so there was this affection towards the rawness of the four track that I was just embracing, excited about too, you know. And so anyways, I just started tracking ideas and stuff at home on my four track, bouncing and and it was really fun to get um, you know, I had a neighbor whose uncle was in town. Um, and he was a beautiful sax player. I would hear him blowing, and I'd be like, whoa, and I'd be like, hey, 
like, I'm working on these tracks. Like, would you mind recording on them? And he'd be like, yeah. And I'd come over with my four track, two headphones, and just tell him like, hey, okay, yeah, over this. And he'd blow over it. And when I mix it, I can kind of like cut out the spots that were clashing or whatever. <laughs> um, and then I just started compiling songs. And then I was skating for Tommy Guerrero's clothing brand at the time called 40s. And he was working on a, a video called Amigos. And he... Um, he was like, hey, I know you're working on music. Like, send me something. And so I sent him some tracks that I've been doing on my four track at home. And yeah, and I remember him, I mean, never forget, in the voicemail, he uh, he was like, hey, you know, you know, I, you know, I really like these songs. Like, I think, um, He's like, I think Thomas would want to do something with it. And Thomas Campbell's artist and him and our friend Greg Lampson, they have a, at that time, they had a label called Galaxia out of Santa Cruz. And they released Tommy's uh, uh, Loose Grooves and Bastard Blues. And so um, Thomas reached out to me because Tommy sent Thomas the, the songs or whatever. And Thomas reached out to me and he was just like, these are nice songs. He's, he's like, man, maybe let's talk about doing something. And but he was like, but I'm working on a surf movie right now called The Seedling. And he was like, man, can I use? He's like, can I use this one song on it? And I was like, yeah, totally. And then um, he was like, hey, you have another one? Because I think those songs he he wasn't hearing anything in it. And I I was working on new songs and I sent it over to him. He's like, oh, this one too. And then kind of much like the video. Um, with Pal Peralta band this, the interest around my segment led to me turning pro. Well, Thomas's little movie led to him, the response to those songs in his movie. He was like, man, let's, let's release something. Let's do something. And that's kind of how that started. Mm -hmm. And then just kind of I released an EP called Triumphant Procession. We did that first. And then I did a full length one after. And then, yeah, and that just kind of got that going. And a lot of it through Thomas, such a huge, I'm so thankful, man, because, you know, in a lot of ways, what he was doing, his movies, those are kind of music videos, if you will. And it pushed me out to a whole nother community. I was pushed out to the surf community. So then they start hitting me up. And, and the surf, it's got more money. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Oh, Yeah. Um, oh, uh, yeah. You know, because that lifestyle, it's already, it's been around for a long time, the surf lifestyle, right? And so those brands, Quicksilvers, Billabongs, Hurleys, they're already big businesses. Mm -hmm. They're big lifestyle businesses. And so when they work, when they do events and things, they've got a good budget. And so when they're like, hey, Ray, will you come play this? Or will you play this art show or play this? You know, they've got a good budget to pay, you know. So what's next? Oh, right now... Um, so I, I finished an album with uh, with my buddy Johnny Herndon. I, know, I think Johnny was on, of course. on the show. Yeah. So that was last year. That album was released, released last year. I've got some art show kind of stuff with uh, I'll Go Play. Um, there's a skate shop called Tactic out in Portland, and I'll hang some prints there and, and, um, and play. I can do a little solo thing with the looping pedal. Um, do that. And then... Yeah, there's talks of going to South Africa in August and um, maybe Japan at the end of the year. But but project-wise, you know, I did a thing with Leica cameras last year out in Wetzlar, their, um, their headquarters. They, they did a, um, a full-on... Uh, they redid their facilities, basically. And so they built a hotel. They built a museum. They, they're doing watches now to compete against Rolex. So there's a building for the watches. And then they're concentrating. Did they give you one? No. <laughs> and then uh, they're concentrating on their cinema lenses, the cinematography lenses. So there's like a building for that. And so um, their the inaugural grand opening party was this time last year. And so they asked me to come play. It was like a three-day event, right? And so they asked me to come out and play, but they wanted me to hang my prints. And so I love the print in the dark room. And so, um, so I worked a great part of 
the beginning of last year putting this show together. Um, and so anyways, they want, um, they want me to add to that so we could do more shows because they have galleries at their stores. And so I've been working on that also. And then, yeah, and then I'm doing a, uh, for the Leica store in LA, I'm going to do a, um, a workshop, a three-day workshop there. They have a program called Leica Academy where they do workshops and things like how-to kind of stuff. A lot of it with their cameras, but I'm going to do one on uh, film processing. And so I'll teach, I'll teach um, the workshop, teach whoever comes to the workshop how to process their film. Well, earlier you were talking about putting things out into the world and f- wanting to feel good about it before you put it out. So yeah, totally. I, I'm feeling good about this conversation. How are you feeling? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that you can edit it to make it not sound like I'm rambling on. I think it's going to be great. <laughs> and it was really inspiring talking to you. Ray Barbie, thanks for being on oh, the show. Right on, man. Thank you, sir. The Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. Trap Set.